I think we have everyone here. Um, I'm Joanna Baker. I just want to welcome everyone to our annual joint meeting with the Washington Conservation Guild and the Potomac Local so so Section of the American Industrial Hygiene Association. I'm, the, I'm a director at the WCG and your host for the evening. Uh, before we begin our talks, I think there's some announcements from WCG leadership and the AIHA leadership. I think Jane's going to speak first. Yes, I am. Uh, so I just, I'll keep, and I'll keep it brief. So uh, I just want to say hello to everybody and welcome you to our second to last member meeting of the 2021-2022 season. After tonight, our next and last meeting will be the May business meeting. <laughs> I realize business meeting doesn't sound terribly exciting, but this meeting should be a really fun one. For one thing, it'll be in person at Dumbarton House on their outdoor terrace, and the house will be open until six if you want a tour inside. This will be our first in-person meeting since before COVID. We'll have wine, we'll have food, and the board is planning a really spectacular raffle. So I hope you'll all really make an, um, make an effort to, to turn out for this. Um, you'll start seeing some of the raffle items being uh, sort of shown off on our social media in another week or so. But most importantly, we will also be announcing at this meeting the results of the election of our next board. So the online ballot was sent out two days ago. If you haven't seen it, check your spam folder. The ballots are due by May 2nd. And the last thing, I want to remind you that we're once again offering Ed McManus's Pewter Spoon Workshop. This will be a week from Saturday on April 16th. And we still have some slots available, surprisingly enough. So Ed was head of conservation at National Air and Space Museum, and he's been sharing his knowledge of pewter casting with the WCG community through these workshops. This is the first one, of course, since COVID. And Ed promises that he will also share some of his expertise on the conservation of pewter as part of this workshop as well. So I, it's gonna be a really good workshop. It's outdoors and lunch is being provided as part of the afternoon. So check our website for details and also so that you can register. Okay, now I'm going to turn this over to David Hicks, who has some words on behalf of AIHA. Thank you, Jane. I appreciate it. I want to just say, uh, you know, how excited we are to have this joint meeting with uh, WCG and our Potomac local section. Um, we've worked together a lot in the past, uh, worked on the, um, the uh, safety and cultural heritage uh, events that we've had in the fall. Uh, with our friends at the Smithsonian and looking forward to uh, you know the next time we're able to do that and also uh, through our collaboration uh, we've started it was uh, through the efforts of uh, many of you and uh, leadership of Kathy Makos our uh, working group the uh, uh, Museum and Cultural Heritage Industry working group within AIHA so uh, you know, if you're a, a part of that, I'm, I'm pleased to hear it. If you want to be part of that, then please join. Uh, you're more than welcome. You don't have to be a, a member of AIHA to be a part of it. So um, for our next uh, meeting for the Potomac Local Section, we'll be meeting on uh, May the 17th. That'll be our next technical session, and we'll be meeting virtually. So looking forward to that. We'll have announcements going out soon uh, about that meeting. And, uh, you know, in closing, I just want to uh, thank uh, Haddon and Jeff for uh, being here and uh, being our technical speakers tonight. So thank you, Haddon. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you to everybody that's here taking up a, a bit of your time to participate with us. So with that, back to Joanna. Great. Thank you so much. Um, I just want to give a couple of reminders. Um, as a reminder, tonight's talks are being recorded and they'll be available on our website in the future. Uh, please use the chat feature to put your questions for the speakers and I'll make sure we get to them. We're going to probably going to do that at the end. Um, we have enabled live captioning also for your use. Tonight's talk is titled The Benefits of Networking Between Regional Conservation Groups and Industrial Hygiene Local Sections. Our speakers are Haddon Dine and Jeff Sotek. Haddon Dine is an assistant objects conservator at the Art Institute of Chicago. 
She has an MS in arts conservation from the Winter University of Delaware program in art conservation and a BS in chemistry from the University of Pittsburgh. Haddon has worked or interned at the Philadelphia Museum of Art, Adam Jenkins Conservation Services, LLC, the Lunder Conservation Center at the Smithsonian American Art Museum, Victoria and Albert Museum, and the Walters Museum. Prior to coming to Chicago, she was the Objects Conservator Fellow at the Strauss Center for Conservation and Technical Studies at, at the Harvard Art Museums. She's a member of the American Institute for Conservation Health and Safety Network. Jeff Sotek is a Senior Associate at Wood Environmental and Infrastructure Solutions. He is a licensed professional engineer, certified safety professional, and certified industrial hygienist. He graduated from WPI with a BS in civil engineering and has focused his consulting career on providing advice to clients on EHS consulting and engineering and environmental due diligence issues. He routinely provides EHS consulting services to manufacturers, colleges, and universities, museums, attorneys, lenders, as well as government agencies. Mr. Sotek has also been a great speaker at numerous seminars, a guest speaker, I'm sorry, but I'm sure great as well, at numerous seminars and short courses for several associations and corporations. He is also an instructor for PDH online and ser serves as vice chair for the AIHA Museum and Cultural Heritage Collections Working Group. Welcome, Haddon and Jeff. Thank you, Joanna. All right, can somebody tell me if you're just seeing the slides? Perfect. Excellent, thank you. All right, I live and work in Chicago. The Art Institute of Chicago is located on the traditional unceded homelands of the Council of the Three Fires, the Ojibwe, the Odawa, and the Potawatomi nations. Many other tribes such as the Miami, Ho-Chunk, Menominee, Sac, and Fox also called this area home. The region has long been a center for indigenous people to gather trade and maintain kinship ties. Today, one of the largest urban American Indian communities in the United States resides in Chicago. Members of this community continue to contribute to the life of the city and to celebrate their heritage, practice traditions, and care for the land and waterways. We're speaking today with Jeff Sotek, and we are both involved in volunteer health and safety groups. Um, as you heard, Jeff is the chair-elect of the AIHA Museum and Cultural Heritage Industry Working Group, and I'm a member of the AIC Health and Safety Network, and we're going to talk about some of the work that these groups do and efforts to network local conservation groups with local industrial hygiene groups, like the two groups that are meeting here tonight, and why these relationships can be beneficial. So I know this audience is a mixture of health and safety professionals and conservators, and maybe a range of knowledge about the two fields and their interaction. So I'm afraid there is probably guaranteed to be a part of this presentation that you will find boring. Um, Smithsonian OEHS people here may be the most likely to fall asleep, but hopefully at least part of it is interesting. So first we're gonna give overviews of both fields for those who are not familiar, starting with Jeff. Just tell me when to go next, Jeff. Thanks, Adam. So uh, as, as uh, Joanna said, you know, I, I, um, I was an engineer by education. Um, and uh, if you had said that I would be involved with the museum community at, when I graduated from college, um, I would have just, it, would, it wasn't even in, in the, uh, I wouldn't have thought it would have been in the cards, but, um, but I've been, uh, I, I always considered uh, myself a problem solver based on that education. And I've been able to use that. I don't do a lot of engineering anymore, but I get involved with a lot of health and safety work. And I've worked with a lot of different types of industries um, in higher education. Um, and this is kind of where, and then where I ended up uh, getting into the, um, the museum community. Um, I met Kathy Makos, who's uh, on the line, and, um, and she helped me out. And that was uh, uh, probably 15 years ago now. So um, we had a problem with an alligator, and, uh, and, 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 and history was kind of wrote. So my project with the museums are just um, some of my most, I wish I had more of them, but they're some of my most interesting um, projects. The people are fantastic. So what, what do I really do though? So, you know, industrial hygiene, um, what is it? And um, this definition or this slide is, is actually pared down. <laughs> so, but uh, it's, um, It's the science of protecting and enhancing the health and safety of people at work in their communities. We 
uh, evaluate uh, hazards, both on the health and safety side. They could be chemical hazards. They could be all over the board, whether it's metals, lead. Um, you know, I'm, I'm looking at a project right now on isocyanides. Um, you know, it could be dust, uh, physical hazards. It could be radiation. It could be mold. It could be then ergonomic stressors. It really goes all over the board. But we're we we're dedicated to anticipating, recognizing, evaluating, and controlling those types of hazards. And that's what we do as industrial hygienists. Uh, next slide, please. If you had to summarize it, basically we are trying to keep people safe. Uh, and healthy at their workplace and also uh, beyond the workplace, their home and their community. We're problem solvers, we're scientists. Um, so we collect a lot of data and we'll analyze that data, uh, whether it's actual physical data from a laboratory or whether it's uh, information we get from field observations. And then from there, we will take that information and try to uh, prevent people from getting exposed to different um, hazards um, or try to eliminate the hazards for them so that so there is no exposure. Next slide. So some of the things that we get involved with uh, specifically, and I, again, we apologize if this is this might be too basic for some people and you know might be uh, so but with that said, you know, we provide a lot of technical support. Um, and depending on the size of your either if you're in a conservation uh, uh, laboratory, uh, you could be one or two people, you could be more than that. If you're uh, a museum like the Smithsonian, you have your own staff of environmental health and safety, you have industrial hygienists, um, but a lot of other museums you have, uh, basically it could be the, um, you know, a conservator or, or, or a uh, maintenance person that's kind of environment in charge of environmental health and safety. But we, um, as industrial hygienists, our role is to, some of the things is, exposure assessments. So whether it's personal assessments, you can see a badge on that person's lapel there. Um, you, in the middle of the slide, you'll see some uh, a pump and cassettes. We're actually taking samples of air on uh, as people work to see what type of um, chemicals they're inhaling. But we also do uh, hazard awareness. So we'll advise like, let's say on labeling, you can see a, a label on this slide here. Um, that was uh, some some specimens that uh, we taxidermic specimens that were were um, arsenic uh, was used as a pesticide on them. Uh, we provide recommendations uh, and designs for targeted local and portable ventilation. So we're always trying to either eliminate the source or control the source before um, before we get into any type of administrative controls or personal protective equipment. We'll also do job hazard analysis uh, and. Um, a lot of us that are in, involved with industrial hygiene are also involved with OSHA compliance. So there's, you know, a thousand pages of OSHA compliance that um, that people uh, are, are that that are um, uh, people need to comply with. Now, you know, we have to filter through and determine out of that out of the big book, you know, what is actually what do you need to comply with at your at your facility or your location. Um, we do training, whether it's you know, we'll talk about respiratory protection training, but there's hazard communication training. There's all kinds of different trainings that we get involved with, fit testing and uh, helping out some of the some of the different things you'll need to do is like compliance plans and things like that. So the, those are a lot of the things that we get involved with as uh, industrial hygienists. Um, and we'll get, I'll give you some case studies uh, later on, uh, giving some examples. All right, next slide. Thanks, Jeff. Yep. All right. So I'll briefly go through some of what conservation involves and then go through some of the example hazards we might encounter, some of which we encounter frequently and some very rarely. Um, for the conservators here, my colleagues have found this entertaining because it makes their job sound very dangerous. Um, so conservation includes preventive work, examination, documentation, and treatment. Um, it requires technical examination and understanding of the life of the object before any hands-on work can be completed. We work with curators and often collaborate with them on research. Um, part of our work is also researching the materials of artworks and how they were made. And we follow a code of ethics for our work and use appropriate materials and document thoroughly as we go. 
So preventive conservation covers a wide variety of non-invasive actions that can slow deterioration. There are a lot of forces that can cause artwork to deteriorate. Many things are slowly deteriorating no matter what we do, but we aim to make that as slow as possible. Light, incorrect temperature, incorrect relative humidity, and fluctuations in both can all accelerate deterioration. Maintaining good conditions and storage and in the galleries is important. And improper conditions can lead to all sorts of issues. Dusting, monitoring pest activity, and rehousing objects are all part of preventive work. So in the lower right, you can see some corrosion that's formed inside an object. Treatment encompasses everything we do to an object. So cleaning, stabilization, repair, and filling losses are all treatment. We may treat objects for several reasons. It may be going on display. Sometimes it has become so unstable that it needs work or damage will continue and worsen. Sometimes you're cleaning an object, removing grime or old restorations. And these kinds of treatments might be very dramatic before and after, but other times we are stabilizing an object by doing something such as consolidating flaking paint. And in these cases, the object might not look very different when we're done. So the examples here are an ancient amphora on the left. Um, there's a mycin porcelain object. And then on the top is an object from the Johns Hopkins Archaeological Museum. And these just happen to be all ceramics, but conservators work on all kinds of materials. The conservators usually specialize in a distinct area or material, and these can include any of the areas listed here. So where I am at the Art Institute of Chicago, we have book frames, objects, paintings, paper, photograph, textiles, and time-based media conservation labs, and we have conservation science. And the treatment labs collaborate with the scientists who have a range of analytical instrumentation that helps to determine the structure and condition of works of art by identifying materials. So I'm an objects conservator. Objects conservation covers almost anything that doesn't fall into paintings, paper, books, photos, or textiles. We treat a wide variety of materials, including inorganic materials such as ceramic, metal, glass, and stone, and organics such as ivory, leather, plant materials, plastics, and more. And many of the things we work on are composite objects. So just in these examples here, you can see ceramics, metals, plastic, textiles, glass, painted wood, and even fiberglass mannequin parts and food cans. Objects conservators also often work on large outdoor sculpture. It's a large task to maintain these huge objects that are exposed to the elements year round. On the right is the head of the objects lab at the Strauss with the Angela Chang with the John Harvard sculpture in Harvard Yard. And on the left is a sculpture at the National Gallery of Art. Conservators also might work at archeological sites, stabilizing and reassembling objects as they come out of the ground and helping to maintain the site. Sometimes conservators work with human remains, such as mummies or other bones. Conservators work in labs and museums, but also in private practice, maybe working out of rented studios or their homes. Conservators may own their own business, but work on site at different locations for contract work. There are also regional centers, which are organizations of conservators who work on both museum and privately owned objects. Conservators might also work in historic houses, which often pose unique challenges and may have minimal lab space. So in all of these situations, the labs may differ wildly. There may be no fume hood or exhaust. It could just be a converted office, or it could be a custom-built lab with state-of-the-art equipment. Depending on where they work, conservators have differing access to health and safety professionals and to equipment. The conservators working alone in their own studio, it's on them to learn and implement proper safety practices. Some museums that are part of larger organizations like university museums have environmental health and safety on campus. And trainings may be required for lab safety, radiation, laser, respirator fittings. And then there's someone on site who can be consulted when questions come up. But even working somewhere with these health and safety professionals, we often encounter unexpected hazards. And these professionals still might not be aware of all the hazards you potentially work with. But they can advise you once they know what you're working with. So it's always good to reach out and discuss things. So before I go into the hazards, I thought I would quickly show a treatment just as an example. So this is from a year or two ago. This is a vessel dated to the sixth century BCE. It's terracotta reduction fire to achieve this black color and the surface was burnished to achieve a gloss. So on the left is a photo from before treatment and the dark areas are losses that have been filled and in painted and old restorations that didn't match. There are also salts and burial materials all over the surface, and it has no foot. And on the right is after I've cleaned the surface, removed those old fills, and revealed the losses. So, sorry. 
Um, I then worked with the curator to figure out what the foot should look like. And this could be a whole long other presentation, but I made a version out of clay and made a silicone rubber mold and cast a plaster version and then painted it. And this is a case where we filled in something that we don't know is 100% accurate, which we don't usually do. So the fill has been painted in a way that makes it clear to a viewer that the foot is not original. All right, so the hazards. We use tools and materials from a variety of trades. And I'm dividing the hazards up here into three categories, materials that we use, risks from tools and equipment, and hazards from the cultural heritage ob objects themselves. This is not a perfect organization. Some things could fall into multiple categories, and this also doesn't cover everything, but hopefully this gives an idea of the range. So we use solvents, acids, and chelators. We use mold making materials like silicone rubbers. We aim to use materials that age well and remain reversible if we're applying something to an object. We often try to avoid proprietary mixtures because we need to know what we're using. So we mix our own adhesives. We're continuously adapting new to us materials from other fields. And we might use things in ways unexpected by the manufacturer. And there might not be much safety information on the material. So all this can comp complicate health and safety around what we're using. Sometimes the field may realize only later that something has health hazards after it's been in use for a while. We use paints, dry pigments, and dyes, a huge variety of adhesives, um, sometimes adding fume silica or glass microballoons. We use putties, spackling materials, plaster. There are some chemicals we may use just for spot tests. Some things we use have hazardous fumes, and others are hazardous because they're fine particulates or heavy metals. We use a variety of solvents, both for cleaning and for mixing adhesives. And when we are working with solvents, we usually use local exhaust trunks, if we have them, or fume hoods and or respirators, depending on the situation. Most often, we are only using tiny amounts, like the small bottles on the left here, so we can just use a trunk. But if it is a larger amount or something more hazardous, I would use a fume hood. And if it's something particularly dangerous or I'm working with something for an extended period of time, I have worn a respirator and worked in a fume hood at the same time. Conservators also work in spray booths sometimes or outside when they're spray applying coatings. In a private studio, a respirator might be the only option a conservator has along with maybe opening a window. But we are usually using just small amounts of solvent. We are always trying to come up with safer and greener methods for everything we do. And we've come a long way, but there are some things we don't have new solutions for yet. Our hazardous waste may include any of the materials listed before, but also materials that have been contaminated by hazardous artworks, for example, swabs with traces of mercury or pesticides. And I'll get more into hazardous collection materials shortly. Just like with materials, we use tools and equipment from a variety of trades. We use artists' tools like brushes and clay tools. We use dental tools, scalpels, steamers, sometimes lasers. So we perform X radiography on objects. On the left here is the setup at the Harvard Art Museums, a lead lined room with a common X ray tube. And sometimes conservators and conservation scientists use analytical instrumentation that uses X rays, including X ray fluorescence, spectrometry, and X ray diffraction. So on the right here is an XRF instrument. We look at objects in ultraviolet light because certain materials fluoresce in UV light. This sometimes allows us to see old repairs, and we can also learn more about the materials of the object itself. So here's that same mummy mask again, and there's a comparison at the bottom to show how that orange pink fluorescence is characteristic for matter. So we're seeing something that's really very, just barely visible in normal light. Conservators sometimes use lasers for cleaning. Um, this only works on certain materials in certain cases, but if you have the right laser and work at the right settings, you can ablate a dark grime crust or corrosion layer off of a lighter surface. Uh, on the left here is a photo of the laser at the Strauss. Conservators use dry ice blasting to remove coatings, which can actually be a very safe alternative to using tons of solvent. Use torches, and we might also use a variety of power tools, drills, saws, angle grinders and ladders, lifts, and scaffolding. So there's also a height safety issue. And sometimes when objects need to be moved, conservators work with riggers and engineers. There are fun stories from different museums about objects where the building was built around them. So moving them later was a large ordeal. And here's just an extreme example of where a conservator might end up. All right, hazardous collection objects. So like the other list, this is not complete. 
Um, this is kind of a fun one because these things can be in a collection without, well, fun, <laughs> without anyone being aware. If they haven't been identified and labeled, people may be handling them without even realizing. And it's important to know what we're dealing with both so that it can be labeled properly and handled properly by anyone going into storage, and especially if a conservator is going to treat an object. Some objects are radioactive. They can differ widely in the amount of radiation and the dangers. So there's some uranium glass here, but radioactive objects could also be objects with radium paint, which could be friable and pose a risk for contamination of surfaces or inhalation. Unexpected objects might be radioactive. This is a gilded silver and enamel bowl I cleaned. It's half cleaned here. And I had no idea this was radioactive until a conservator I was working with suggested I hold a Geiger counter near it. Many paintings and painted objects have pigments that contain arsenic, mercury, or lead. And it's not a problem if you know it's there and it isn't flaking, but if it's friable, it could be a hazard. So at the, this is, these are photos from the Harvard Art Museums where they have the Forbes Pigment Collection, which is a collection of historical and modern materials for technical studies of art. And these are used as reference materials for technical studies. So here are some examples from that collection. There's a jar of vermilion on the left and in the middle is lead white. So as Jeff mentioned before, um, taxidermy has had many, there can be many different materials applied to taxidermy. There could be arsenic and other pesticides on their organic objects, naphthalene and PDB. And mercury may be present in many collections on mercury tin amalgam mirrors. As these mirrors degrade, the mercury can drip. On the right here are photos from work by preventive conservator Melissa King showing dripping mercury and the process of collecting it off the floor in a historic house museum. And mercury was also used in the making of certain kinds of hats for a long time, and it can be found in other unexpected places. A colleague of mine at Herbert and I found it a um, mercury putty that was used to attach metal fittings to a porcelain tinker. Degrading plastics release various gases and also ooze toxic compounds. So the PVC on the left is oozing plasticizer and on the right is a Barbie with fluorescence all over her legs. She's also PVC, but different additives. Asbestos can be in objects. On the left is one of the nutshell studies of an explained death created by Francis Glessnerly. It's a dollhouse sized murder scene that was used to train detectives. Behind the windows are lights, which used to have asbestos light cans. And there are also many, there were many panels of asbestos that couldn't be removed. And I helped conservator Ariel O'Connor with this project. And we worked with Chuck Fry, the Smithsonian staff industrial hygienist and consolidated the asbestos in place. And on the right is a jacket at the National Air and Space Museum, which also contains asbestos. Sometimes collections can have live ordinance. These are screenshots from an AIC health and safety article in the January 2020 newsletter. In some collections, spears and knives may have poison on them. And dusting can pose health hazards as well. Objects can be moldy. Sometimes conservators may be responding to emergencies such as water or fire or water events or fires. And sometimes collections have been infested with rodents, such as archives that are being acquired could pose a risk of hantavirus. So I don't know if that just made it sound like the <laughs> job is very dangerous, but there is a lot of expertise in the field and we do have an awareness and understanding of these risks. But there are places where there may not be, there are museums and cultural heritage organizations where there may not be an awareness of all the hazardous collections or access to scientists or health and safety professionals. And there are also always times when we're surprised by things. So it's constant learning and striving to be as safe as we can. So before we talk about networking, local groups, we wanted to briefly introduce the AIC Health and Safety Network and the AIHA Museum and Cultural Heritage Industry Working Group. These two groups work closely together. The AIC Health and Safety Network works to increase knowledge of health and safety information, including hazards, control measures, and general health issues. We write articles, including a monthly column in the AIC newsletters, give presentations, and help make guides and other resources. And the group continually adds to the AIC Health and Safety Wiki, which is great, um, it's still being worked on. And we do all of this in collaboration with occupational and environmental health and safety professionals from the AIHA, AIHA Museum Working Group. So the AIHA is the American Industrial Hygiene Association. So sort of think the AIC for OEHS professionals. 
and they have a museum and cultural heritage industry working group. And this museum working group is a volunteer working group focused on museum and cultural heritage industry health and safety, and it's sort of the perfect match to the AIC health and safety network. Jeff Sotek is the vice chair of this working group, and the groups work closely together. These are some of the goals of this museum working group. They're working on raising awareness by participating in mutual conferences and promoting allied networking between local sections, which is what we're talking about. Um, conservators and industrial hygienists jointly present at AIC, at AIHCE, and smaller meetings, and they contribute health and safety resources to cultural heritage emergency preparedness and response networks, and work to provide guidelines and occupational risk management tools. So it's a very active group. Um, they're creating fact sheets on collection-based hazards and controls. They're developing teaching collaborations and training modules for museum studies programs. They're working on writing a paper on OEHS emergency planning, interfacing with cultural heritage response teams, and coming up with improved resources on where and how to get fit tested for respirators. The AIHA Museum Working Group, and actually I think it's usually Jeff himself helped arrange for local AIHA members and local OSHA onsite members to be at the health and safety booth at the AIC conferences. So if you didn't know this about the booth, there is a booth at AIC and you can go up and ask health and safety professionals questions. And that's because of the relationship between these two groups. These two groups also collaborate with other AIC groups, including Emergency Response and Planning, the Sustainability Committee, and sharing health and safety, network, health and safety info to um, professionals who may not be conservators through the Connecting to Collections Care Network. And hopefully you saw the announcement, I think it was last year about the, I guess not new anymore, relatively new AIC Health and Safety Forum. And this is a dedicated place to ask and discuss health and safety issues. And members of the AIHA working group are part of it. So there are health and safety professionals answering questions or members of the AIC Health and Safety Network finding answers. So anything you're unsure about, you can now put it here without being nervous about putting that on the global forum and you can get actual health and safety professionals responding to you. So please join this. Um, like the other forums, you don't have to be an AIC member, it's free. You can just sign up for the digest emails and read them or not. And now I'll pass it back to Jeff for more exciting part. Um, he's gonna talk about some case studies and his role working with museums and conservators and examples of local networking benefits. Hey, thanks, Ann. Um, you know, every time you give that, I've probably seen that presentation five times, I always learn something new about what you do, so it's awesome. Um, so I'm gonna give a couple case, uh, case studies. Actually, can you go back one slide if you don't mind? The, um, so the first one is um, trouble with mercury artwork. Um, what is the black goo? I always, uh, when I thought of this, uh, when they first, uh, um, asked me to help on this project, this uh, one museum. I, uh, for some reason, I just had this vision of the X Files, and I know I'm dating myself, but the uh, and they had those episodes with the black goo, and, and you know, so that's kind of what came to my mind uh, when I when I uh, first presented this. So can you go to the next slide. So what, what are we talking about? We're talking about mercury, and um, the question that was originally posed to me was, um, what is this material? Um, we have this uh, exhibit and uh, we know um, the exhibit was uh, contained mercury, but we don't know what it is. Now we know that mercury was used in a lot of um, historical art, um, different scenarios. In this particular case, this is the Mayan uh, burial chamber of the red, uh, I think it was called the Red Queen where they, they unearthed this uh, burial chamber. And um, this, this uh, woman was, was uh, had red dust all over that turned out to be um, mercuric uh, sulfide. Um, but, you know, vermilion was uh, the, the pigment and, uh, it, you know, was used in a lot of ceramics, murals, tattoos, relig uh, religious ceremonies, it was used uh, quite a bit. Next slide. So I was asked or I was contacted by the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art to discuss a problem with an art exhibit. You can see on the right side there that there are about seven or so funnels uh, on the ground there. And you can see that, or hopefully you can see that there, 
uh, it's uh, gray uh, on the top. Well, the artist um, had this, this exhibit that had mercury in, in those funnels, and that was the exhibit right there. So um, now this exhibit was uh, put up in the 80s and was in exhibit for 10 or 15 years or so, and then it was taken down and put in storage. So basically they wanted to uh, revive this exhibit and put this back up, but they had a couple surprises when they, um, when they opened up the, um, the packaging. So uh, next slide, please. So, um, so when they opened up the, um, the first package, they found out the, the funnel had this kind of blackish grayish material on top of it. And they didn't know um, what it was and they didn't know what to do about it. Um, but basically these funnels contained about three to five ounces of mercury. And um, although in the past, you know, I don't know if, uh, I remember having this big quart jar of mercury in high school, but you know, those, but back then I guess we, uh, people are still, you know, people are playing with mercury with their fingers and stuff that, you know, I guess we realize now that mercury is a lot more toxic as a neurotoxin than, than uh, before. And uh, so this, this was a much more serious matter today, of course, than it was, you know, even 20 years ago. So the question initially was, what is this goo? What is this sludge? And what, you know, can we still use this? Um, and um, can we clean this? You know, what do we need to do? Next slide, please. So the first thing we suggested was uh, you really need to find out do we have an exposure situation. So you know once we open up these crates, we want to take some measurements. We know that mercury is is the one metal that does have a vapor pressure and therefore will emit um, you know mercury to the air in which people can be exposed to. So so we wanted to determine um, what the air was um, once we opened up these these crates. Also we wanted to know. Um, kind of how they planned on doing this, what the routes of exposure would be for this operation that they're planning. And then um, try to figure out from a risk management standpoint, okay, now we know what you're gonna do. Um, how are we gonna manage that? You know, how can we do this safely? So, you know, one of the first questions we were asking was, you know, do you have any local exhaust? Um, what type of personal protective equipment do you have on site? You know, what type of training do you folks uh, have? You know, have, you have basic HASCOM training, do you have, training specific to mercury? Do you have any spill control associated with mercury? Um, in this particular case, uh, we, did, uh, we did find out that the museum already had, at least they had a, um, a fume hood that was uh, available for use and in good operating condition. Uh, so they had at least some local exhaust um, as an option, um, which is not always the case. Um, so this was uh, at least some good news from the start of the project. Next slide, please. So we opened up the uh, the, the crate, uh, and um, you know, and we did an examination as best we could. We we used a um, a um, uh, a meter. I think it was a Luminex uh, meter to to evaluate the uh, the determine if once we did open up the crate, were there any uh, I guess uh, trapped uh, mercury. Um, in the air, and um, it, it appeared that the funnels were in good condition. It appeared that the packing was in good condition, so it didn't appear that there was any obvious mercury deposition on, on the materials. It didn't appear that there was any um, obvious, um, obviously, uh, any, any spillage or anything like that. Next slide, please. We did have a surprise, though. Um, so I guess, uh, back in the day when they bought this, um, they determined that, um, I guess there was a sale on mercury in China is, is the story I heard. So, so we ended up finding, you know, close to, you know, a, a pretty sizable amount of mercury, I guess, uh, which was good and bad, I guess. Uh, so the question was, you know, the, I, I guess that ultimately what is gonna happen with this. Um, so if we need this mercury, uh, you know, this might be a good thing, but if we have to dispose of it uh, because it's unnecessary, it's pretty expensive. So, um, but that was a quite a big surprise, but I guess it was one of those where, uh, uh, one of those scenarios where they got a volume discount basically. So next, uh, next slide. So, um, so there was a, a little bit of mercury 
vapor detected in the void uh, space under the, the styrofoam packing material, um, but it was not detected uh, adjacent or outside the crate. Um, we determined that there was some um, amount of uh, inhalation and dermal exposure hazard. Um, and, um, and you know, at that point we determined the fume hood was suitable for to work uh, to, to safely uh, use if they did want to go forward with the with the the um, restoration of their funnel artwork. Uh, next slide, please. And <clears throat> unfortunately, I'm not sure where this project ended up. I'm, as a consultant, sometimes we don't always hear the um, hear the end of of what happens. Um, the um, we know that they were they were determining whether or not they wanted to proceed forward. We had gotten in, in get them in, in touch with some environmental contractors. We determined that we probably would not be able to clean the mercury, um, and it would have to be you know disposed of. Um, and uh, at that point, unfortunately, we don't. I, I I didn't have a full picture as to if they decided to put this back into storage or if they ended up. Uh, um, going forward with the project. But what we did uh, come to the conclusion was, what is the black goo? So, which was the first question they posed. And um, we, of course, we didn't analyze this by, by any type of like gas chromatograph or, or any type of uh, other, uh, other type of uh, analysis, but we did surmise that the, um, the mercury was a mercury two sulfide, which is known to be gray or black in, in color. And that's what we suspect. So. Um, we know that either the there was a little air void in the top of the funnel, and and we're not sure if uh, how how secure the funnel top was, but whether it was pollutants coming in from the general California area, or if it was originally, um, or you know originally in the space, uh, we imagine there was some sulfur oxides that were um, causing the contamination source. So that was a a, a pretty fun project, a, a generally a a small project, but again, very interesting, kind of had some twists and turns to it. So th that was one example of um, how industrial hygienists can, can help. Um, next uh, slide, Adam. So the next um, case study is about uh, apothecaries. Um, so I'm currently helping out a, uh, a museum and um, they have a collection of about, well, hundreds to, th to thousands of of these these small containers of of um, of different uh, apothecary items, pharmaceutical items that were in, in dental items dating back, you know, from the turn of the the nineteenth uh, century to you know sometime uh, more recent. But um, the interesting thing about about this was so we were um, we were approached to help them with a project to try to inventory, catalyze, and, and possibly dispose of unwanted material um, and try to determine, you know, are these materials posing a threat to your customers, um, your museum base, as well as the, the workers that, that are involved in these areas. The next slide. So what's the, what's the issue with all these um, uh, with all these containers of, of different chemicals. Well, the issue is that, you know, some are, are non-hazardous, innocuous, but then others could contain hazards. And, and um, hazards are, are all over the board. They can be from flammables, the poisons, the pesticides, the radiologicals, uh, opioids, corrosives, other general toxics. So, um, you know, it's putting on your, your homes and, and Watson hats and, and and trying to figure out what these hazards are. Um, if anybody is interested, uh, you know, there's a book called The Poison Squad by, uh, I think Deborah Bauer, I think is the name, but it talks a lot about um, about the basically uh, the formation of, of how the FDA got formed, and, and they talk anything be, you know before 1920. It was kind of the wild west. You just don't know what's in these in these containers because there was no requirement for people to. To say what was in them. In fact, they did not want you to say, did not want you to know what was in them. There was a, a even a big discussion about whiskey because they were saying people were not putting whiskey in their whiskey because and it because it was a, a lot cheaper. And um, 
and they felt that if we had to label that with the appropriate, you know, that would be a, that would be a huge problem for them. So they people fought a lot of the um, FDA um, requirements for for a long time, and uh, finally, I think it was the twenties, late twenties. Um, you know, a, a more robust FDA uh, act was passed and gave the federal government the authority to really regulate um, foods and, and drugs. And um, it, it, it basically took some, some children being, you know, really seriously um, injured by eating uh, candy that was laced with like arsenic or something like that. So anyways, next slide. So these are some pictures from the uh, apothecary, um, uh, some of the collections. Some of them, again, when you when you walk through this, you can see um, um, you don't have to be an industrial hygienist to, to know that you know some of these things are going to have uh, hazards. You can see uh, in the middle slide there, there's some acid. I think it was uh, hydrochloric acid. Um, you can see ether on the right side. You can see ammonia on the, I mean, on the left side. You can see ammonia on the right side. But then you can. Um, as you start peeling back the onion, per se, um, you can see that uh, there's a lot more to, to what's in there. So elixir of iron and, and strychnine squib. So uh, you can see a big jug there, and that was in the dental office. I'm not sure what they were using that. Um, but you can see uh, the upper one is one of my favorites because that was from a traveling doctor's bag. But um, you can see different medicines that contain strychnine as well as contain arsenic. and um, you know, just medicine was was a lot different back then. Um, next slide, please. So, what did we do in this particular project? So, this one was uh, was you know somewhat similar, but we had a little bit more upfront involvement, which I think um, really helped out the museum. So, we um, we helped them with a, with a grant preparation pr process. So, so they had identified a grant. That they felt that that would be um, that would work for um, for this uh, for what they were trying to accomplish, um, and um, they um, they found a grant, and I helped them um, put together a scope of work as well as um, uh, help them with the monetary end of it to determine well how much you know would it cost for you to provide us with with some of these uh, different services that we would like to do to keep you know to do this safely. And uh, so I worked with them on the front end to, to get that going. And um, they ended up receiving a grant and included in that grant, this was one of the museums that did not have a, a fume hood, but they were able to get a fume hood, a uh, small fume hood to, to help support this project. Um, so we provided some, like I said, local uh, ventilation recommendations. We, I provided them recommendations on the fume hood. Um, we provided recommendations on PPE and so personal protective equipment and respiratory uh, respirators um, that they uh, they would use during the inventorying process. Um, we gave them advice on the program itself, the respiratory protection program, and we gave them training. Once they um, we gave them advice on where to go for the, the uh, medical clearance as well as fit testing, um, and then we provided the training um, and helped them with the inventory inventory considerations and disposal consulting. So right now we're in the process of, they're going through this inventory and they, um, everything is getting cataloged. And, you know, we're going through these questions and answers. Uh, uh, so, uh, you know, with just these, these, you know, every time like a chemical would come up, uh, you know, determine, you know, do we have a hazard here? You know, what can we do with this? Is this a problem? And we've, uh, we've found some pretty, uh, interesting uh, chemicals like, you know, uh, we found a uh, mercury cyanide, which is, you know, the best of both, I guess, worlds from a poison standpoint. Um, and, uh, you know, and some things like that. So we found some, uh, some really interesting things uh, in this process. And uh, they haven't got to the stage where they're deciding what to do with these chemicals. But we, I think we're at the point now where we're almost done with the inventory. So fun project again. Um, and, uh, I guess if you can go to the next slide, Adam. So the last case study is uh, on natural history. And um, go to the next slide. And uh, this one uh, was at the Oakland Museum of California uh, and a three-story structure. Um, 
you know, pretty large building, uh, 300,000 square feet, about a, you know, 100, and another 100,000 square feet of non-exposure uh, space. They had a uh, warehouse that was, um, you know, down the street, a uh, totally separate building, but it has rich collections of historic organic objects. They, uh, although they are the Museum of California, uh, prior curators uh, was, did a lot of collecting and uh, acquiring from all over the world. So although they, they are now predominantly focused on state of California, they have a lot of collection in there from, from, from everywhere. And they had a, a, a pretty uh, large photographic collection. Next slide. Uh, can you click it again? There we go. So uh, skeletons in the closet. So this was actually taken from um, uh, one of the first projects I did, but it's just to give you an example. Um, uh, so they had a lot of taxidermic specimens here and um, we we're trying to just ultimately figure out. Now, a lot of times right now we'll qualitatively determine whether something has ar uh, arsenic or mercury. Um, and there's different ways to do that. Like whether you're taking a wipe sample or you're, or you're using an XRF or something like that. But um, this particular project, we ended up taking some um, taking some samples of the dust and some wipe samples actually off the and, and putting them for laboratory analysis. And you can see some of the um, some of the uh, levels are quite shocking. Like you know, the songbirds were at two hundred forty thousand parts parts per per million, and that's just like you know, that's a really really high number for uh, for arsenic. Um, when you start talking about uh, if arsenic is a hazardous waste, uh, I, I believe the number is five. So, so this is, uh, you know, so they really, you know, some of these different types of specimens, they really peppered this stuff with, uh, with the different pesticides. Um, next slide, please. They also used the pesticides uh, and they had quite a collection of, of, um, of Native American and, and uh, other types of uh, historical objects um, like baskets and bowls and things like that. Uh, but in particular, the, the baskets were um, sublime was used to, uh, you know, a form of um, mercury chloride, mercury chloride uh, to preserve those. Next slide. So, um, so in this particular uh, project we had, um, they had done some, some sampling and some, some different analysis on uh, some of their collection but they really needed someone to come in and kind of take a more, I guess, um, higher level look at, um, at where they were and what they need to do and, um, and where they need to focus their efforts on. So, so we did initial review of, of what was done to date. And um, you know, we identified um, arsenic and, and mercury and, and some of the taxidermy specimens. And, um, and we knew that, uh, uh, Parodichlorobenzene or PDB, um, which is you know uh, commonly with mothballs um, and other volatile organics, were going to be associated with the taxidermy specimens. We knew they had used those, and we knew they had formaldehyde and alcohols associated with fluid preserved specimens. Next slide. But what they didn't have was any task-related employee exposure assessments. They knew employees were working with taxidermic specimens, but they didn't know um, were they working on with the correct amount of, of personal protective equipment? Did they need respiratory protection? Um, they had uh, local ventilation was limited in some areas um, and, uh, and maybe just area ventilation versus local in other areas. So they had a portable exhaust ventilation unit that had been serviced in since you know a long time. Um, some employees were wearing respirators without medical clearance, training, or anything like that. Um, there's a lot of uh, programmatic unknowns. Next slide. And I would say, you know, it sounds like it was, it, it was uh, I'm not trying to get these guys in trouble or anything like that, but I think that they were, they ultimately were, um, they were, they were suffering from the fact that they, uh, they were run by by Oakland at one point, and then they, they ended up being um, private or vice versa. And of course, there was a change of the guard, and uh, and now they're trying to re regroup their their uh, programs in place, and uh, and that was part of what they were trying to accomplish here. So, so again, you know, who's managing the EHS program? You know, what about the training? You know, um, 
who has internal knowledge of regulations. They had, okay, well, we haven't done anything in the last five years. What ha what's going to happen to us if someone, you know, if you have a problem? So there's some fear of past act of not doing anything. Um, they had some uh, cohesiveness problems between internal departments trying to figure out, you know, well, who's in charge of it and, you know, those types of things. And then, of course, money, 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 money. So trying to figure out, uh, you know, how things can get paid for. All right, next slide. So what we ended up doing for this project was we did uh, we did more exposure assessments, but particularly to job tasks. Okay, if someone is going to be uh, cleaning a taxidermid specimen, um, you know, uh, you know what type of PPE and respirator protection do they need? You know, those types of things. Uh, we advised them on labeling. Um, you know, they had none of their none of their uh, collection storage areas labeled, so we provided them with some support there. We provided them recommendations on targeted and portable ventilation. We helped them with um, obtaining a new, um, a new portable uh, exhaust hood um, because the one that they had was so old that just unserviceable. We did more uh, hazard assessments as to for different tasks. We kind of outlined, okay, these are the these are the ten tasks that you know uh, the collection care group. Uh, you know, and conservators uh, we're, we're working on, and and um, we didn't get too much in the facilities group, but and and, um, and and what type of PPE and what type, what are the hazards associated with them? We also provided some OSHA compliance recommendations um, regarding plans and things like that. Provided uh, respirator. Um, we put in this case, we provided fit testing and respirator protection uh, training. Next slide. Okay, and um, so so I guess uh, so that was the end of the uh, the different case studies. Um, if anybody has any questions at the end, I mean I'd be willing to obviously entertain anything that that comes up. Um, some other collaborative examples uh, we talked uh, this about the uh, the health and safety summit that is a uh, you know that happened by the in Washington and. Um, that's been going on for many years. Um, the AIC, we've been trying to do these fit testing events um, at these different AIC events. However, um, um, I think the last year we had, obviously with COVID that's been, been tough, but it's been, we've been trying to get that organized. I think we're, we're ready to go in, uh, in Los Angeles, but, um, but I'm not hundred percent sure there. And uh, we've been giving a lot of joint presentations at AIC and AIHCE, which is the technical national conference uh, for the AIHA. So, next slide. So here's uh, just a uh, just a slide associated with the uh, you know uh, the cultural and uh, safety and cultural heritage summit. You can see the Smithsonian, AIHA, the local Washington. Uh, Conservation Guild, the National Collections Program at the Smithsonian, and the SAAM. Uh, so this is a, a great collaborative effort between these different organizations. Um, if you've ever had an opportunity to attend one of them, they're just, they're wonderful from a standpoint of the different information, the speakers, and, um, and so they're well worth, uh, well worth the, um, the time. Uh, so there's just some examples of some of the different uh, speakers that are that are um, there. Next slide. So one of the things that we've uh, we've been promoting um, and uh, is the respiratory protection. Um, so lecture and fit testing session, and uh, you can see a couple pictures from the past. Uh, so uh, with COVID, of course, this has been less. Uh, hasn't been uh, as easily to do, but um, but that's something that we're we're trying to basically offer going forward um, uh, and trying to get uh, you know. So I know this is a, a constant issue with conservators in particular, um, but but we're uh, again we're we're just trying to support that. Next slide. So this is the uh, the uh, current meeting, which is in Los Angeles. Um, I don't know. Oh, the date is May uh, May sixteenth. 
So, uh, so we all we have a um, I know we have a booth going there with um, OSHA on site will be there as well as a member from the AIHA. Uh, so they'll be able to answer questions throughout the whole event. And like I said, I believe we're trying to get the fit testing available for 20 minutes intervals um, on Monday. Okay. Thanks, Jeff. Yep. So DC area, these two groups here tonight um, are an example of successful networking and collaboration between these two groups. And you have this long ongoing partnership between the Washington Conservation Guild and the Potomac AIHA local section. And there are many other AIHA local sections that correspond geographically to conservation sections. And we are attempting to Sorry, I was going to turn my video back on. But I'm not figuring that out. All right, <laughs> we're attempting to network them with DC as kind of an ideal example. So AIHA local section members are not necessarily members of the museum working group. So we're also actively working on spreading awareness of conservation as we try to link these groups up with conservation associations. And hopefully it gets so the conservators have someone they can maybe reach out to when they need to hire a consultant or get advice. So Jeff and I presented at the end of 2020 to the AIHA New England local section at their fall meeting, and then we presented to the New England Conservation Association. And other conservator and industrial hygienist pairs are planning to adapt to our presentations at their own local meetings. So our hope is to initiate connections all over the country between local conservation groups and AIHA groups. If you don't work somewhere with EHS colleagues, you might rely on the health and safety network for advice, or you might need to call a professional for a consultation sometimes. And if you're working for a small business, small museum or have your own business, it might be helpful to have connections. And we're hoping that this can lead to relationships like here in DC where there could maybe be respirator fit test events, maybe joint presentations and collaborations. And there are some areas that are already well on the way to this, like the relationship between Circa and Southeast Regional Conservation Association and the corresponding AIHA group. And as a final point, we wanted to tell everybody about the OSHA onsite consultation program. So this is a program for small businesses that has already been in place for many years, but the recent development is that there's a pilot program launching for small museums, historic houses, any small cultural heritage organizations. So staff who understand the risks associated with the hazards posed by cultural heritage will come to your facility, provide confidential workplace safety and health assistance at no cost. And they can help you identify potential safety and health issues that may arise within your workplace and develop strategies. And they can also assist you in recognizing underlying factors which may have led to these hazards. So this is separate from state and federal OSHA enforcement. The consultants don't issue citations or penalties. However, if you request consultation services, you are agreeing to correct serious hazards within agreed upon timeframes. So basically, if you agree that you'll fix anything major that they find, they'll come and do an assessment of your workplace for free without getting you in trouble. And you can then have a list of things to work on. And I believe, Jeff, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you can also call them in for specific areas or issues that you may need help with. So it doesn't have to be a full entire workplace assessment. And this image here is just a... Oh, go ahead, Jeff. I was just saying that, that's correct. Okay, thanks. The image here is just of the generic onsite consultation information, but there are more specific flyers about the museum program going out soon that maybe are already out in some states that are in the pilot program. Yeah, we have seven, seven states that are in the pilot program. So, um, and uh, I just heard from recently that, um, that we're starting to get some traction with some definitely some interest with the. Uh, the museum and conservative groups coming back to us with uh, asking for support. So, so that's uh, so it seems to be we seem to be getting some traction. And the last, we were just going to say, talk to Jeff if you're interested in joining the AIHA Museum Working Group and the Health and Safety Network. I believe recently posted that they have currently have some open positions as well. And of course, there are other ways to get involved without formally joining either group. So. Thank you for listening. And I guess we'll, we'll take questions now. I can figure out how to get my video back on. You'd think I'd know how to use Zoom at this point. That's okay. We can um, still ask you questions. Um, <laughs> so is the best way to get, if you're in need, if, you, if your organization feels like you're in need of an, an industrial hygienist, is the best way to go to the OSHA site? Or where would you suggest someone start first? If you say you're at a museum and you, you feel like you have an issue, 
we feel like you have an institutional issue. Um, is the OSHA site the best place? Is the working group the best site? Where, where would you go first? Um, but I mean, that's, that's a good question. The, um, you know, there's, I guess, uh, if you have potentially an issue like the, you know, for small businesses, you can go through the OSHA onsite consultation program. And that, and in, in every region, uh, there is a, um, there is a, a, a connection, you know, um, that you can call and then, and then set that, you know, get that set up and they'd, they'd be happy to come out and take a look at your issue. Um, if you don't want to go through the onsite program and you want to go through a, uh, like a private consulting firm or something like that, then, um, you know, I, I, I may be, uh, you know, I guess it's a little tougher to, tougher to find uh, people that way, but you could go through the AIC or the AIHA um, and, uh, you know, ask for uh, any consultant that, you know, is in a particular location. Um, you, you know, I, I would probably go through a referral process maybe uh, and, um, you know, any consultant that, uh, you know, um, I'm sure they'd be happy to help out. You know, that's what we do for a living. So, um, but that, I guess that would be the two avenues that I would either, I would go on, go, go through. Um, so if you did not go through like OSHA, I understand that, you know, they, you know, the process going through them, how you have to yep. agree to fix any, anything that, that's wrong. Um, is your con consultation with like a private IH consultant confidential, or do you have to report major issues to different authorities like OSHA or EPA? No. I mean, that is the one difference when you hire a private consulting firm is that we work for you. So we don't, we don't consult, we don't, uh, we might give you advice that you don't like, <laughs> you know, but, but we don't, but we, we don't have any reporting obligation to OSHA or to anyone else. So. When someone hires a private consultant, is the typical scope larger or have you gone in to work on small issues as well? Um, it just depends on what your issue is. I mean, we, um, you know, we could work on projects um, from projects that are like, you know, a total of $500, which could be a small training for someone to, you know, you know, tens of thousands of dollars or even hundreds of thousands of dollars. If you're dealing with, you know, redesigns of entire HVAC systems for entire buildings or whatever. So it all depends on what you need. But a lot of the, a lot of the projects that I've been dealing with, with museums are in the you know, I would say one to ten thousand dollar range, just depending on what they what they need. You know. Great, thank you. Um, I, just one like nitpicky question about uh, one of your your projects. When um, there is it possible to re retain the historic historically labeled historic labeled containers in the apothecary collections if if they contained hazardous re substances or do they have to be discarded as well? Um, you, you don't, there's no, um, the only regulation uh, that I'm aware of is if, um, if you have containers that are acutely hazardous um, waste, in which case there are specific requirements and they, they um, where you would have to triple rinse the container um, if you want to keep it. Other than that, um, you know, obviously you, if you want to keep the container, um, you know, You've, you're, uh, you've got to dispose of the material inside, uh, you know, in accordance with environmental regulations and doing it safely, but there's no, um, there's no requirement saying you can't keep a container. It's just really kind of what are you going to do with that material is really the, that's the, that's the big question. Great, thank you. Um, I think we have a couple more questions. Um, there was one question about how often you should do a fit test, but someone else answered annually. What, what are your thoughts on that? It's annually, unless you're involved in the asbestos industry, which is semi-annual, but for 99% okay. of people, it's annual. Okay, great. And they talked about, you know, if there's changes in appearance or things like that as well. Um, let's see. Um, talks about not being afraid of OSHA. <laughs> <laughs> um, and they said it's free as well. Um, great. I think and they said if anyone has any questions, please pop them in quickly. So we're getting close to 715. 
That was a great, super informative. Oh, here we go. Where's another question? A couple more questions. Oh, no, they're just thanking you for the program. Super interesting. Thank you guys so much. It's really um, helpful. I think it's hard for some people to connect the dots sometimes, um, but just pointing out these things that these things that lie below the surface um, is super important. So we appreciate you taking your time and, and speaking with us. Well, thanks so much for having us. The um, Like I said, I would encourage anyone that um, is um, that wants to join the working group. We're, we're a fun group. We, uh, we're very active though. And uh, so, um, and uh, you know, we, uh, we have a lot, of, a lot of things going on, so I, you know it's uh, it'd be we welcome new members all the time. So great, thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Haddon. Appreciate it. Have a good evening. Thanks, thanks. everyone, for joining us tonight.